go sublime. I shall achieve in time. Topsy Turvy. It's a portal, and it takes you inside John Malkovich. Being John Malkovich. Have fun. Yeah. Boys don't cry. What do these three titles have in common? Well, all three are on my list or Janet Maslin's list of the 10 best movies of 1999. And on this first show of the new millennium, we'll be discussing the best films of the year just past. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. I'm Janet Maslin. I'm the newly former chief film critic of the New York Times. <laughs> I'm sorry you decided to leave at the Times. I've really enjoyed your reviews over the years. Oh, well, thank you, but it was time. <laughs> on this program, Janet and I are going to highlight selected titles from our individual lists, building in a grand crescendo to our choices for the best film of the year. And now let's start with the number eight movie on my list, American Beauty by Sam Mendes, which is both a comedy and a tragedy about a man who fears growing older, losing the hope of true love, and not being respected by those who know him best. The man is played by Kevin Spacey in one of the best performances of the year, and he lives with an indifferent wife and a scornful daughter until one day he explodes. How dare you speak to me that way in front of her? And I marvel that you can be so contemptuous of me on the same day that you lose your job. I didn't lose it. It's not like, whoops, where'd my job go? I quit. Quitting his job gives him a new freedom. He's no longer trapped by the rules, and soon he's able to contemplate still more rebellion, including a hopeless love for a girl as young as his daughter. Some people say American Beauty is about suburbia, but that's only where it takes place. It's about fears and yearnings that almost everyone feels one way or another, I think, but few act on, and it's just as well that they don't. The Kevin Spacey character acts on them, and he pays the price, but that's not only his tragedy, but also his victory. I agree with you that there are a lot of good things about this movie, most particularly Kevin Spacey's performance, mm -hmm. but there's also something about it to me that just feels very familiar, that there's nothing really in it that we don't already know in terms of its satirical edge. I, I think it's telling us very familiar things about American life. Well, you know, a lot of movies are familiar, and it's really the style and the tone and the energy, I think, that makes them new. And in this case, what I see is a guy who really feels trapped by the deal that society has given him. And I think we can see that in a lot of the movies this year, where people feel yeah. like institutions mm -hmm. or rules or the emerging modern society or whatever has really got them pinned down. Well, that's true. But I do think there's a cynicism to this film that's really kind of one note and is laid on very thick. Let's begin my choices on a note of controversy. <laughs> Eyes Wide Shut is liable to be some people's least favorite film of the year, but it's on my list at number nine. I think it's a strange, unsettling, and subliminally powerful film that takes the audience into a waking dream state along with the characters. If all it took to be great were to be misunderstood, this mass-marketed, not-so-sexy Stanley Kubrick art house film would be the year's big winner for sure. And why haven't you ever been jealous about me? Well, I don't know, Alice. Maybe because you're my wife. Maybe because you're the mother of my child, and I know you would never be unfaithful to me. The main character in this film is a self-satisfied doctor played by Tom Cruise. And then we see him suddenly thrown off balance, and he tries to navigate a path between socially acceptable impulses and forbidden ones. You could say that this is the film's way of turning his battle with sexual temptation into a metaphor for civilization as a constant struggle, or... You could say that it cannot have been easy to put so many naked extras into a film and make it dull. I like the first interpretation. I think Eyes Wide Shut will stand the test of time. Well, I agree with you. I know it'll be a controversial choice because mm -hmm. a lot of people didn't like this movie. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not on my top ten list, but it's right below it. It's kind of tied for 11th place, and I admired it very much. I, I think liked, people I liked wanted to see it for a lot it. of the wrong reasons. They were lured into it yeah. thinking that it was going to be something that it just was not. It's a good film, yeah. so we agree on that. The number five film on my list is Bringing Out the Dead by Martin Scorsese, and this is about a harrowing three days spent with Nicolas Cage as a paramedic in New York's Hell's Kitchen. In one scene after another, this great director evokes fear, dread, guilt, and passion. You swore that you'd fire me if I came in late again. You swore it before. I'll fire you tomorrow. Even better than that, what was I thinking about? I could forward you some sick time. Bringing Out the Dead was a rare box office failure for Scorsese, and the critics didn't exactly line up behind it either. But since all of the skill and craft and art were there, why didn't more people respond positively to this film? I think maybe it's because the film is so sincere, so heartfelt, in a time when audiences like their tragedy to be laced with irony, like in American Beauty. Scorsese doesn't put his movies in quotation marks. He means them. And Bringing Out the Dead is about the existential choice to keep on trying and hoping 
even when nothing seems to work and all hope seems to fade. I really respond viscerally to this film as I did to a lot of his films. Well, I did to it also scene by scene. You said you mentioned it that way before. For me, the problem with it is more just the way it, it does or doesn't hang together. I thought, for one thing, it's in the shadow of Taxi Driver. It's very like uh, kind of a, a later look at some of the things he did early in his career. Mm -hmm. That colors it a little. And I thought on its own, it doesn't really cohere that much. I did admire a lot about it. You know, it. all great artists, though, and I think he is a great artist, yeah. Uh, have a consistency in their themes and in their obsessions over a period of time. And this is another driving through the city of hell movie like Taxi Driver, but I think that here you have more hope. I mean, Nicolas Cage wants to redeem. He wants to cure. He wants to help. And... I'm talking about millions in Kuwaiti bullion. You mean them little cubes you put in hot water to make soup? No, not the little cubes you put in hot water to make soup. Continuing our special show on the best ten films of the year, my list, and Janet Maslin's list from the New York Times. The number three film on my list is Three Kings by David O. Russell. And this, for me, was one of the year's most dazzling films. Rich in detail, prodigious in invention, telling a story that begins just as the Gulf War is ending. George Clooney, Mark Wahlberg, and Ice Cube star as three U.S. soldiers who find a map to Iraqi treasure and conspire to sneak behind enemy lines to try to steal some gold. Got no dig. What you mean, cannot take? We kick Saddam's ass, we definitely take. We are the United States Army. You are three guys with a bunch of civilians and no Humvee. So the movie is an adventure, yes, but it's also a lot of other things. It's about how the world is shrinking, so you can no longer objectify people as foreigners. And it uses dazzling visual techniques to show how violence and anarchy go hand in hand with weird coincidences and senseless accidents. This is the first film that really captures the vision of the great modern war novel, Catch-22, in my opinion. It is a lot like Catch-22 in some ways, but I just much preferred Flirting with Disaster, which is the film David Russell made mm -hmm. before this. I think he's a very witty writer and director and has a very uh, strange, wonderful comic sensibility, and I thought this was very ambitious visually in ways that he couldn't always pull off with the camera. I did think it worked visually. I liked the way that he shows the impact and the moment of impact when bullets hit. The bullets hit in this movie in a different way than another they sure war do. film. <laughs> and I like the way the uh -huh. camera uh, kind of leaps into the middle of the action and becomes a protagonist. I, I really like his visual energy here. I liked what he was trying to do that way, and I think a lot of films this year tried to use the camera mm -hmm. in, new, in new ways like that. I just, uh, I'm not sure I thought he worked. I came all the way from New York to be disagreeable. Well, that's okay. okay. You got another movie on your list? I do. Okay. Um, the film on my list at number eight is not The Blair Witch Project. <laughs> and it's not on your list either. Behind that great Blair Witch marketing strategy, I don't think there was much of a movie. But the documentary called American Movie is an un-Blair Witch project in a way. It's about one more guy who dreams of hitting it big by making a no-budget indie horror picture. But there's a lot more to Mark Borchardt's story than a get-rich-quick scheme. And in this sometimes riotously funny, but also very touching, documentary by Chris Smith, we gradually find out why filmmaking really is a matter of life or death for Mark. Who the hell in their right mind would tell the world, yeah, I'm going to do this? And then think, man, where am I going to? I'm broke, man. i got to get gas tomorrow. And dude's talking about making a feature film. The audience at first doesn't know anything about who Mark is or why these cheesy-looking horror movies mean so much to him. And then, all of a sudden, American Movie begins to draw a bigger and bigger picture and make it clearer what he wants to rise above until you can see that for him this really is a version of the American dream. It shows this guy who, you put it so perfectly, he must direct films. Yeah. And he has his whole family, he has his poor uncle, he cleans out his uncle's bank account. And he's completely account. unself He makes his it, mother too. shoot, he has to hold the camera, he's got his friend banging his head into the kitchen cabinets for special effects. Yeah. And this is really why people make movies. Not everybody makes the kind of movies that Mark Borchardt makes. Yes. But this is, it is a great documentary. And this is not another spoiled guy with his parents' credit card. This is somebody who really has to struggle to do what he's doing. When we come yeah. back, Janet and I continue our countdown to our choices for the year's number one film. Hello, Marge. When men play, they always play at killing each other. That's an intriguing scene from my number five film, The Talented Mr. Ripley. It's adapted from Patricia Highsmith's insidious murder mystery. It is written and directed by Anthony Minghella, and it's proof that this filmmaker's dazzling work on The English Patient was no fluke. Matt Damon plays a young man who first covets and then steals the identity of a spoiled, wealthy golden boy. I like him. 
Marge. You like everybody. There's an obvious debt to Hitchcock here in the choice of a Highsmith novel, the La Dolce Vita allure of the late 1950s, and even the casting of Gwyneth Paltrow as the sophisticated blonde. But Mingela's own style is much more sensually suggestive than Hitchcock's, and he presents strong, ravishing imagery here that seems entirely his own. This may be a genre piece, but I think it's also bracingly original. Oh, it is, and I think Hitchcock would have been attracted to this material very much. What's uh, interesting is the Ripley character, who, of uh, course, Highsmith went on to write more novels about, and this is a person who, as he complains in the film, yeah. has no being. There is no one inside. He adopts or annexes the personalities and existence of other people. He is just kind of a human vacuum, a need to be someone. And I think that's really his motive here. He doesn't want to be rich. He doesn't want the girl. He doesn't want the car. He wants to be somebody. Mm -hmm. It's tricky and clever in the way that people don't usually make thrillers these days. Yeah, That's what I like about it's it. It's a good film. Okay, now for the number two movie on my list, Magnolia, which tells a series of interlocking stories in a Los Angeles that seems to be vaguely heading for some kind of biblical apocalypse. The movie was written and directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, whose Boogie Nights took a similar approach to the pornography industry, but now he focuses on aspects of more mainstream show business and the way the city seems haunted by the ghosts of past glories. Here, William H. Macy plays a foolish middle-aged man who was once briefly famous long ago. I'm Quiz Kid Donnie Smith from TV. Might have been before my time. Magnolia is about the way life is arbitrary and accidental, no matter how many plans we make, and it has a brilliantly unexpected conclusion that pulls the rug right out from under all of our expectations. Well, I think I love this movie for the first two hours. I think this guy is enormously talented, and then I think it comes in for an amphibious landing <laughs> that um, blows the whole thing away to me. I think, I think, talk about arbitrary, you begin to think that what he did earlier was arbitrary too, and that is really, uh, that's damaging. To me, the whole heart and soul of this movie is the arbitrary development that you're referring to, uh, and which we will not reveal. Yeah. Because at the beginning, you have that entire spoken narration by Ricky Jay about coincidences, yeah. about strange urban legends. And I think the message that's percolating beneath the entire film is that all these people are so urgent in their own life and death matters, and what they don't realize is we're part of a gigantic celestial machine that's wheeling along on its own without any regard at all for what we think the story should be or how it should turn out. Can't argue with that, but I found some of the connections a little arbitrary, more so than they even had to be. For me, the best American film this year is my number two pick, Boys Don't Cry. It tells how a young woman named Tina Brandon yearned to reinvent herself as a young man named Brandon Tina. Hilary Swank handles this transformation so stunningly that it's hard to imagine the movie without her. And her performance becomes all the more moving when Brandon falls in love. It's not bad, huh? Mm. What? <laughs> no. Why not? You're beautiful. Chloe Sevigny is just as terrific as the young woman who has faith in Brandon despite everything and everyone around her. This is a latter-day, gender-bending Theodore Dreiser story, devastating in its sense of hope and longing as they come up against hard reality. Boys Don't Cry is also a real high on my list, and I agree with everything you've said. And Chloe Sevigny, of course, yeah. is the person who is crucial because through her eyes, we see this girl who wants to be accepted as a boy, and through her reactions, we are able to read Brandon Tina, so that's a crucial role, and it's a great film. She's really what transforms us into a, just a sad, terrible tabloid story into, into something more. Absolutely right. Coming up next, our individual selections for the best film of 1999. My choice for the best film of 1999 is Being John Malkovich, directed by Spike Jones, who also played one of the soldiers in Three Kings. Being John Malkovich begins with a scene of inspired surrealism as John Cusack goes to work in an office with ceilings that somehow seem awfully low. Then he finds an opening behind a filing cabinet that is a secret portal into the mind of the actor John Malkovich, who plays himself. There's even a moment when John Malkovich goes through the portal and winds up inside his own mind, which is kind of like disappearing down the black hole of your own personality. I have a hunch this film will still be delighting audiences at the end of the next 
century. If I had to put one film in a time capsule about how our minds are beginning to work with all the crazy new possibilities that technology gives us and the idea of portals and brains and all, all the other crazy stuff that's in here, this is the one I'd choose. There's something about it that really strikes a chord. It's on my list, too. And it's so funny, too. I mean, it just... I was, when I wasn't laughing, I was chortling. When I wasn't chortling, I was smiling. And what I was amazed by was that Spike Jones comes up with new inventions right to the end. The last half hour is as amusing as the first half There's hour. Nothing better movie. than not knowing what's going to happen it's got next. A wealth, it's got a wealth of inspiration. Yes. It's a wonderful film. I agree. But my choice for the best film this year is Topsy Turvy. Maybe it's hard to believe that a film about Gilbert and Sullivan and their reign as kings of late 19th century light operetta could be this enjoyable. But, as directed by Mike Lee and filled to the brim with wisdom and exuberance, it's a knowing look at life in the theater, the nature of inspiration, and the sheer joy of the creative process. First part of this long and very wittily detailed film finds this popular, successful theatrical team in the doldrums. And then, halfway through the movie, along comes the idea for the Mikado, and the whole tone changes. Three little maids from school, three little maids from school. It is like watching the sun come out. I hope audiences will like Topsy Turvy as much as I do, but there's a warning that goes with this. Be prepared to find yourself singing along to songs like Three Little Maids from School when you come out. It is, first of all, a wonderful period piece. Then it has all of this stagecraft in it. I think Mike yeah. Lee is really interested in how shows get on the boards, how they're rehearsed, how they're cast, the deals, the contracts, the personnel mm -hmm. problems. It's a wonderful film about the theater. And I love the fact that it begins when they're already successful. Yeah. It shows that there really is a kind of next act for, for anybody in the creative field. Anyone who goes to see your best film or my best film we'll leave happy. is going to have a good time. That. Okay, when we come back, Janet and I each provide our full list of the top ten titles. And now, as promised, here are our top ten lists, beginning with my ten best films of 1999. Number ten. The Dream Life of Angels, Eric Zonka's turbulent French film about sexual politics and friendship under fire. Number nine, Eyes Wide Shut, one last spooky vision from Stanley Kubrick. Number eight, Chris Smith's American Movie. Number seven, The Insider, smart and stylish Hollywood filmmaking from director Michael Mann. Number six, Being John Malkovich, directed by Spike Jones. Number five, The Talented Mr. Ripley by Anthony Minghella. Number four, David Lynch's The Straight Story, a film that makes simplicity cutting edge and actually gives the G rating a very good name. Number three, Pedro Almodovar's Tour de Force, All About My Mother. Number two, Kimberly Pierce's Boys Don't Cry. And number one, Mike Lee's Topsy Turvy. Okay, and now for my list, starting with number ten, Michael Mann's The Insider. Number nine, Topsy Turvy, a brilliant recreation of life in the theater. Number eight, American Beauty, directed by Sam Mendes. Number seven, The War Zone, the directorial debut by Tim Roth, who has made a bleak and brilliant study of a family in crisis. With this film, a great actor becomes a great director. Number six, Princess Mononoke, the dazzling and enchanting animated film by Japan's Hayao Miyazaki, who blends myth and fantasy into a story of medieval Japan. Number five, Martin Scorsese's Bringing Out the Dead. Number four, Boys Don't Cry, great performances by Hilary Swank and Chloe Sevigny. Number three, Three Kings, directed by David O. Russell. Number two, Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia. And my number one choice being John Malkovich. And you know, this was your last year as a full-time film critic for the New York Times, and I really think mm -hmm. it ended in your honor with three or four months of great films. Oh, well, if, if, if I can take credit for that, I'm thrilled. It did end very well this year. Yeah, because it started kind of discouragingly, and then all of a sudden... It started horribly, and now we're going out with great hope for the next uh, millennium. Yes, we are. Remember, you can check out our top ten list on the web at ebert-movies.com, part of Go Network, and also on our individual newspaper websites. Next week, The Other Side of the Coin, our special show on the worst movies of 1999. <laughs> That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Planning on renting any movies this winter? Then be sure to pick up a copy of Roger Ebert's Movie Yearbook 2000 with more than 650 full-length reviews available at bookstores everywhere.